Hello and welcome to this very special event. It's the first partnership between Tortoise and the Washington Post. And we're really excited to see what we can learn together today as we try to make sense of what happened on Capitol Hill at the beginning of 2021 and what might happen next in the US. And I should say, just by way of intro, if you're, if you're loyal to the Washington Post, um, but new to Tortoise, thanks for joining us. We're um, a London newsroom set up to do something a bit different. We, um, we live by a couple of um, articles of faith. I think the first is our mantra, slow down, wise up. And I suppose it means, you know, that we don't do breaking news. We try to tell deeper stories to help us make sense of the forces shaping the world. And the second is that, you know, we are very committed to the idea of open news where we open our news meetings like this thinking to hear from as wide a range of people as we can and to help sharpen what we think and Im improve our journalism. So um, that's us. I'm guessing you need no introduction to the Washington Post. Um, we've got some really great guests from their editorial staff, though, today to guide us in the conversation in the next hour. And, um, you know, the, all of them have played big roles in, in this brilliant series, The Attack, that the Post uh, launched a, a, just over a month ago, I think. And it was this truly immersive attempt to account for what happened, you know, before, during and after January the 6th. So we'll just whiz around just to say hi. We've got investigative reporter Aaron Davis. I'm hoping we can see everyone on their screens. There's Aaron. How you doing? Welcome. Thanks hey. for having me. Good to see you. And uh, national reporter Amy Gardner. Hello. Amy. Good to be here. Nice to see you. And uh, politics and investigations reporter Ros Helderman, who's in the office and delighting in it. Yes, uh, great to join you all. And, and we've also got um, Philip Rocker, who, um, who until relatively recently was White House bureau chief. He's gone off and written a um, you know, bestseller about guess who, Donald Trump. And, uh, and you know, he's, um, he's, he's continuing to sort of plow the, uh, the investigative beat for, for the post. Good to see you, Philip. Yeah, glad to be here. Thank you for having us. So it's, it's a lot of pretty amazing diggers and a lot of um, Pulitzer Prizes in the room. Um, so, you know, we're going to hear from all of those guys. But again, just to remind you or tell you for the first time, if you're new to this, um, uh, you know, we also want to hear from you. It's not, it's not a free ride. You can uh, get stuck into the chat. And, um, you know, usually that's where a lot of the action happens. And you can raise your little digital hand. I'm sure you've been on Zoom before now and um, tell us what you think and what you know. That's that's what we're we're after tonight. And we usually have a, we do usually have a, a no questions rule, but you know, I think a bit like democracy itself, it's subject to change and uh, not always um, not always enforced. So, you know, feel free to, um, to lob a question either in the chat or by raising your hand. And I should just introduce myself. I'm David Taylor, one of the editors at Tortoise, and as our founder, James, likes to say, um, a recovering Washington correspondent. I was, uh, I was in the US from 2012 to 19 and in, in DC for the Times of London and then with Guardian US through, um, through some of the, the Trump madness. And, um, you know, uh, James, our co-founder as well, back in the day was, uh, was in DC for for the FT. So, so you know, we're, we're all sort of fighting the urge. He's promised not to get too excited about doing an event with the Post. And I'm going to resist the urge to talk for an hour about baseball in general and the Washington Nationals in particular, um, except to say what is going on with Max Scherzer joining the Mets. But we'll leave it there. And um, I think probably because we've got a lot to get on with, we should, uh, we should get to our question. So the attack how secure is American democracy? That's what we're going to be running around this uh, lunchtime in DC and this evening in London. And so yeah, I suppose it built into that question really is the, the notion that we really want to look forward. But I, I think in order to, to get us going, we need to reflect on what happened a little bit um, as well. And, and I just want to say before we all um, we probably inevitably um, develop crushes on some amazing uh, reporters. I'd like to speak up for an editor, if I may, and um, I'm just <laughs> introduce you to Matea Gold, um, who was um, 
I'm right, I hope, in saying the controlling mind, the lead editor on this project. Um, I just want to know, you know, editors always in the shadows, aren't they? Um, but just for a second, just tell us, um, you know, you, you stepped back, you thought about the enormity of January the 6th and you had an idea. What was your idea? Well, first of all, thank you for having us um, and welcome to all of our readers and viewers um, across the sea there. Uh, this was an incredible collaborative effort here at The Post and we ended up having more than 75 journalists across the newsroom participate in this project. And the inspiration for it really came last spring uh, when it appeared pretty clear that there was not going to be consensus on Capitol Hill for a bipartisan commission to look into the origins and the impact of this January 6th siege on the Capitol in the way that there was after the 9-11 terrorist attack. Um, and we really thought it was central to our public service mission to try to tell the most complete story possible about not just that event that day, but what led to it and as importantly, what has ensued in the aftermath um, and really the entire tale that we sought to um, unfurl for readers is one that I think shows that January 6 was not a singular event, but part of a long running effort to undermine not just the election, but democratic institutions across the United States that we're continuing to um, report on today. Mm. I mean, it's it. it, it you can hardly overstate the the importance of the the journalistic enterprise really as you say everything um feels at stake and hangs on that um that you know those very kinetic events of that day and um, phil i wonder if i could start with you um because i i think it'd be great just to remind us of some of the context because of all of the days in the calendar of a presidential race this should be one of the dullest right that's exactly right. So January 6th was the date uh, prescribed by our Constitution in the United States when the Electoral College uh, votes from all the 50 states were formally certified by the Congress. It, it's uh, kind of a ritual. Uh, there's not much drama to it traditionally. The Electoral College uh, votes are determined, of course, by the election the first Tuesday of November. And, uh, and then there's a process in each of the states where the uh, the electors gather where this, the votes are certified by the states and then the states submit their votes up to Washington to the Congress and January 6th is the day uh, that a joint session of Congress convenes in Washington uh, to formally certify the votes and officially declare uh, the winner. That, of course, uh, in 2021 was was Joe Biden. He, he clearly won, uh, you know, in enough of the states to, to win the Electoral College majority, and that was certified in the individual states. And so there wasn't a lot of uh, drama around January 6th, but Trump and his allies started to see this date on the calendar as their last opportunity to subvert democracy effectively, to try to overturn these election results by sending uh, those results back to the states in places like Georgia uh, and Arizona and some other states where he thought Republicans in those state legislatures could then uh, try to effectively dismantle the vote and turn it around and, and somehow keep Trump into power. So it became an important date uh, on the calendar, even though historically it has not been. Yes. And and I suppose, you know, um, I as in so many of these inflection points during the Trump era, you, you, it was so signposted, you know, he, he, he would often do his work in, in full public view. Um, and so I suppose we, we went into that day with, with a, a bit of trepidation. We knew that there was going to be a gathering, but um, I'm, I mean, tell me about your morning. Did you expect to be covering a big story that day? Uh, my morning, you know, I, I did because we knew there was going to be a lot of kind of pomp and circumstance around the actions uh, on Capitol Hill. And, and I was kind of watching from home because we, of course, were all working from home and because of the coronavirus health restrictions and uh, monitoring all of the activity on the floor uh, of the House for that joint session of Congress and, and writing a, a piece about what happened that day. Uh, of course, I, I knew there were, and we all knew there were thousands of, of Trump supporters out in the streets and who were gathering at the Ellipse and the National Mall and kind of all around the city, but we of course did not uh, fully anticipate how violent uh, the events would end up becoming uh, at and around the Capitol that afternoon. Mm. 
And and Amy, I wonder if I could just bring you in um, early on here. Um, you know, the, just to think back to that period in the, the the weeks after you know the result was called for um, Joe Biden, there was some pretty sketchy lawyers and and lawsuits um, around the place and um, and some challenges, but they were they were sort of mostly ridiculed, weren't they? And um, I, I wonder. I mean, did you, did you feel that there was visible evidence of a system, the uh, of electoral ver verification that that held up? Uh, I think that the that the initial days after the election uh, were 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 a, a distinct period where we didn't know how ridiculous it might become, mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't know how long the 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 sort of objections would last. You know, you heard very often from lots of Republicans. Look, it's really close in these key, you know, five or six states, and we have the right to do our due diligence and and exhaust all our options legally through the courts and otherwise. And so, it was it was a process that sort of slowly crept out of control in a way because that those initial days seemed fairly typical of partisan. Um, you know, machinations when the stakes are as high as the presidency of the United States. Mm -hmm. But once the states started uh, certifying results, and once the courts started rejecting those legal challenges, the tenor changed. The other, another thing that happened that I think is quite noteworthy is that a lot of the lawyers who had been working uh, with the Trump campaign started dropping off. Mm -hmm. And so you were left with a very different uh, you know, crew of legal representation, Sidney Powell, Rudy Giuliani, Jenna Ellis, who, who were making increasingly outlandish claims about what might have happened in the election. And th that tenor started to shift I, I, be really before the end of November. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it only grew as we, as we approached uh, January 6th. You may remember that the uh, Georgia, which was a, a huge focus of the Trump campaign and, and Trump's allies, uh, was was going through a pretty uh, sort of complicated and extended counting process. It was taking a few days after the election, and the calls of fraud were were, were growing with each day that passed after November third. And one of the senior election officials in Georgia, a man named Gabe Sterling, who we we featured in in our project uh, basically predicted that the rhetoric was was getting out of control. Uh, the threats to election officials were starting to appear. We were we were starting to write about them. Mm -hmm. His colleagues and subcontractors were getting threats. His boss, the Secretary of State of Georgia, had snipers positioned at his home to protect him and his family. And he predicted that if the rhetoric didn't stop, there was going to be violence, which unfortunately turned to, turned out to be very prescient yeah yeah absolutely thank you amy and and, and ros i wonder if i could uh, bring you in um just to i i i, sh I should say i i know that um the 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 sort of rubric of of your amazing investigation was that it it's it sort of compartmentalized into before during and after isn't it and I, and i know that uh, that you and amy were um were really the the anchors of of the after um, January the 7th onwards. Um, but I, I, I'm going to um, just just thinking about um, January the 6th, if I may, even though it's out of your um, <laughs> out of your range slightly. Um, the images are, I mean, were so indelible of, of what actually happened, but I, I just wanted to um, to think about some of the numbers just to sort of um, set the table, really. Um, so, you know, we know that um, Obviously, the the Capitol Hill was 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 overwhelmed and inundated. But I, I wonder if you could just tell us, um, just to, to give us a reckoner, what we know now about how many broke in, how many have been charged, the kind of sentences. How has it played out in that respect? Yeah, I think the last time I looked, it was now over six hundred people have been charged with um, uh, criminal actions that day. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe, if I remember correctly, uh, our Justice Department has said they they now believe as many as 5,000 entered the Capitol. Um, uh, we don't really know how many people um, 
were rallying outside. Uh, clearly the numbers outside was part of what made uh, the numbers inside so difficult for law enforcement to deal with because there was just this sense that there was a vast uh, sea of people outside uh, who could be following on the ones who broke in and made it into the building. Uh, so I, I, it, there's very much still a very active criminal investigation underway here. People are being charged uh, with having entered the building, having assaulted police officers um, uh, every single day here still. And in fact, I think there's more people at this point being charged than having their cases resolved. Um, I don't believe that anyone has actually uh, gone on trial yet for what they did on January 6th. We're still in the phase of having some number of people pleading guilty uh, and getting sentenced uh, to, you know, anything from a few days to months uh, and and even more uh, in prison for what they did that day. Uh, has there, there has been, been a consistency, um, would, would you say, when it's come to, uh, to sentencing? Yeah, there has been some concern expressed by uh, the judges who have been dealing with some of the cases that they seem to feel as though some of the sentences that have been recommended by prosecutors have not been entirely um, consistent. Uh, what the prosecutors have been trying to say is that they're trying to sort of sort people uh, into uh, people who entered the building uh, but did nothing violent and didn't do any vandalism or break things, people who broke windows, people who rallied others, and then of course they are reserving what's likely to be their highest recommendation uh, for people who committed violence, particularly against uh, law enforcement. There has been this tremendous effort to whitewash uh, what happened that day. Uh, mm -hmm. We have heard from various um, Republican politicians in the months since who have talked about that day as a, a, a tourist visit. Uh, tourist the visit. former yeah. president himself has said mm -hmm. it was a love fest with law enforcement. And one of the things that really comes out of those uh, legal cases as they unfold is a real sense of just how violent it was, how many different kinds of uh, makeshift and um, intentional weapons were used against law enforcement that uh, it was a really for the for the police officers who defended the Capitol that day. Uh, it was a real day of, of violence like nothing they thought they would see um, outside of uh, those who were military veterans potentially in a combat situation and, and um, one of the things who, who that. Your, we um, I, excuse me i'm so sorry. Oh, I was just going to say one of the things we talked a lot about in the uh, in the after chapter of this project was uh, just how traumatic that has been for law enforcement, how they have been struggling uh, with trying to cope with what they saw and did that day. Well, there's what I was about to say, like one of the key figures in your reporting is a is a woman called Captain Mendoza, isn't she? And um, I, I wonder which of you um, interviewed her. Uh, Aaron actually interviewed her, so that's a good transition over to Aaron. Well, I'd, I'd certainly love to um, to hear a little more about her experience as, as we go through this hour. But um, Aaron, I wonder, um, you know, I mean, the, there are so many big questions about the day. Um, but I suppose one of the biggest is, you know, was it was the storming of the Capitol orchestrated or a spontaneous event? And I, I'm sure that... Um, that must have been uh, one of the questions that you scribbled down um, almost immediately. You know, um, how much of this was was pre-planned, and then and then I guess you know another enormous one, um, which I'm sure consumed you as a as a reporter, was um, how much did the authorities know in advance? So I wonder, I wonder if um, we could start with that really straightforward question because you because you really took the heavy reporting load on. Um, running the what happened before didn't you um were there red flags and and how did law enforcement respond well you're right we we kind of started from a, from a point of you know back in may i guess it was when we launched this project and as matea said once there wasn't going to be any question, congressional investigation we had for the months leading up to that <clears throat> written our own series of stories what had happened that day everything that we could discern about how the the mob had moved through the Capitol. Mm -hmm. um, but then we, we we paused in May when it looked like Congress was not going to investigate uh, the you know what happened itself and began looking at our own uh, unanswered questions of what happened that day and things that we would ultimately have 
like to have had subpoena power for the way Congress would to answer these questions, but we didn't. And yet uh, we kind of started all over. All of our reporters, our beat reporters, those who cover national security agencies, cover the White House, everyone went back and started to re-report the day. Uh, people they talked to, everything we thought we knew about the day, everything we thought we knew about the days leading up to January 6th. And that kind of took us in a, in a couple directions uh, that were led to some new material. Um, one of those was, uh, as you said, on the red flags issue. Um, you know, we there were things in the ether. There were things that uh, President Trump had uh, said on Twitter. Uh, one of the most remarkable uh, being back on December 19th, uh, a couple weeks before January 6th, he said, there's going to be a big protest on January 6th. Be there. It will be wild. And one of the things we try to do is to go back and look at not just what he had said, but how people had reacted to that in real time, uh, knowing what we knew then of what had transpired on January 6th. How did you do that? Well, there were, there were some repositories of, of, uh, of material that was still online. A lot of it had been taken offline. There were a lot of research groups and we, we kind of unearthed that there had been this network of researchers and academics who'd been charting this kind of through the lens of either looking at um, uh, you know, militia groups or uh, domestic extremists and, and other vantage points, or even foreign extremists. And they became uh, captured by what they were seeing in those weeks ahead of time, that this became the most important thing that they should be tracking. And so a lot of these uh, networks of academics and researchers uh, were also tied into former national security officials, former deputy attorney general, former national security council members during the Obama administration. Um, and so we were able to, with their help, piece together a lot of things that they had captured in real time in those weeks leading up to January 6th. And we found that there was, in, in some ways, an avalanche of, of warning signs that really came in beginning around December 19th with that tweet uh, from President Trump. That people, I think, I think, I, think I, I think I heard you saying that um, it, it, it really was like someone had fired the starting gun on, on December the 19th. You know, there was suddenly people were, were doing GoFundMe's to try and get to to make the trip. And, and, you know, there was just it was a really galvanizing thing for people, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, for those weeks between back in early November when the election was held till mid-December, as Amy said, there was this huge transition from it just being, well, he wouldn't acknowledge that he lost to embracing these conspiracy theories about why he had lost and the votes had been manipulated overseas and sent back somehow and all of these, uh, you know, very uh, amazing claims. And it had got to the point where by December 19th, there were clearly from what we saw people who had bought into it. And then it became not just a question of believing it, but acting upon it. And uh, people saw the December 19th tweet as an invitation to, to come to DC. And we, there were discussions about not just coming to DC, but is he really speaking to it? Does he want us to come armed? Is this the revolt? Is this the thing we've been waiting for? Mm -hmm. And, you know, quickly a consensus grew among a huge number of people online. Our reporting even then led to uh, a number of situations we found where these discussions were flagged by people involved with them as concerning and sent to law enforcement across the country uh, weeks be weeks ahead of time. Most often those warnings went to where they should have gone, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. That's our domestic, our chief agency in charge of domestic terrorism. Yes. And trying to prevent that, and and so the the law enforcement picture it it, it certainly when, when it gets to January the sixth it's this incredibly disparate um, um, group of entities, isn't it? You know, even though all of the action on the day sort of happens within a probably about a you know radius of about three quarters of a mile at most, you got you know you got I think I'm right in saying parks police. Secret Service, DC Police, Capitol Hill Police, FBI, all, all had a role to play. And, the, and I, if I followed along uh, in your journalism, they, they were all talking to each other, weren't they? But, um, and, and they were all receiving intelligence, but it, it, it's what they did with that intelligence that, that it seems to be a point of concern. I think that's exactly right. Um, you know, I think, uh, I can step back here just for a second. And if you think about the laws that exist in the United States about 
First Amendment protections and freedom of speech, so many of them are rooted in decades ago of you know anti-war protests and and things like that. Uh, back to the Vietnam era, uh, to the um, you know uh, era, uh, and you know those carry forward through through uh, September 11th, 20 years ago. Uh, where a lot of uh, liberties, civil liberties, were kind of, uh, you know, stepped on a little bit in the wake of, of September 11th. But all the things that changed 20 years, ago, 20 years ago in the United States were really so much geared at looking at foreign terrorists and people who were trying to harm the United States from abroad. And so there was never uh, an equal or, you know, corollary to, to how and began to look at threats that might emerge from inside the country. So fast forward to uh, January 6th, and you have a lot of law enforcement agencies looking at things that Americans are saying online and treating it very differently with, than the way they treated things that were said online by Muslims in the wake of September 11th. The FBI even told us that many of the things that they had seen were aspirational violence, that they weren't really planning this, they were just talking about it, they hoped it would take place. Well, the United States locked up a lot of people after September 11th for aspirational violence, and here it was treated very differently. And in some ways, we found that law enforcement agencies couldn't really get their heads around the idea that largely uh, white middle class, uh, you know, Trump supporters would take on the police the way that they did, even though we have documented back to December 20th that they did, in fact, receive those very kind of warnings that people were talking online about overrunning police taking members of Congress, putting them on public trial, ostensibly for not bowing to President Trump's mm. uh, contention that the, re- the election was rigged. So there's certainly, I, uh, you know, I suppose a question that's, that hangs in the ether is, the, you know, the, that of, you know, were the FBI complicit in standing back, but at least the uh, the minimum position seems to be that they had a failure of imagination alongside a, an operational failure from and that cascaded because once, um, you know, the, with that particular warning I've cited a couple of times around the 20th, they passed that along to their law enforcement in D.C. And you're right, just going from the White House to the Capitol, you passed through about five different law enforcement jurisdictions in, in the U.S. Capitol. And they passed it along to all those saying, no need for further investigation, case closed. And they did that repeatedly leading up to January 6th. And so the message that was forwarded, the message that was circulated and digested, I think, by those other agencies was there's going to be something happening, but not we shouldn't take these at face value. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Aaron. That's really, um, that's, I mean, we could talk about that for the rest of the hour, I'm sure. Um, I, I'd like to, uh, it leads us sort of into Trump's behavior. Um, you know, and I think, Phil, probably one for you. Um, you know, a, a huge question over all of this is, you know, did he know it would happen? Did he help to orchestrate it in some way? We, we've, we've heard about that inflammatory tweet of December the 19th, but we, we sort of know, don't we, that there was, um, you know, there was something going on at the Willard Hotel and there was this rally. We want to know you know, how, how they were communicating with the White House. What did you go into the day understanding about that rally? And and, I, and what did your reporting lead you towards um, after the fact, once this big investigation began? Yeah, you know, that's a really important question. And our, our reporting from a, a large team of Post reporters on this project showed uh, that President Trump uh, did know a lot of people were going to be coming here. In fact, he tried to bring them here uh, to Washington, that is. Uh, he wanted a big show of force on January 6th in Washington. He wanted that rally at the Ellipse to be large and boisterous and angry. Uh, he fed the crowd uh, what they wanted that day, of course, but he also did in the days leading up to it on social media um, at his campaign rallies down in Georgia. Uh, in a couple of days before January 6th, his message to supporters uh, was to try to stoke their anger in hopes that that uh, would then uh, convince members of Congress 
uh, to overturn or, or to, to send the electoral uh, college counts back to the states when they convened on January 6th, which was in, in, in Trump's view, uh, the way he was going to hang on to power. That, of course, was not uh, legal or constitutional, according to virtually every credible constitutional scholar. But, but that was the, the president's mindset at the time. And what we learned in our reporting about January 6th is that you know, after Trump left, uh, after Trump at, at the rally at the Ellipse told his supporters to go march on the Capitol in that show of force, uh, 187 minutes passed before yes. he actually told them to uh, go home, to stand down, to stop the violence. And in that period uh, is when there was so much harrowing violence and destruction and indeed mm -hmm. death. Uh, at and around the Capitol. Uh, it was a period of time when, according to our reporting, uh, many of Trump's advisors, his allies, his aides, uh, the, the top Republican in the House, Kevin McCarthy, they were calling him, pleading with him to intervene, to send a message on Twitter or in any other means uh, to his supporters who were, at, who were storming the Capitol at that time to tell them to be peaceful and to go home and to stop what they were doing. And yet President Trump resisted uh, those pleas for 187 minutes until he ultimately recorded a video, reluctantly so, uh, in the Rose Garden telling people to go home. Uh, it was a, What's your understanding of where he spent those 187 minutes? Yeah, our, our reporting shows that President Trump spent most of that time watching television. So he has a large uh, TV screen in the personal dining room that's just next door to the Oval Office. And it's where he, as president, would spend a lot of his time, frankly, watching TV and, and talking casually with his advisors and and various aides in the White House. And that's where he was on January 6th. After he returned uh, from the rally at the Ellipse, he went into the dining room and he watched uh, everything, the rioting take place live on television. Uh, and our reporting suggests that the president was captivated by what he saw. He at first uh, was pleased to see such a show of force, to see people waving his flag and wearing his red Make America Great Again hats and chanting his name. And, you know, there was energy to that crowd and they were trying to uh, effectively steal this election and, and keep Trump in power. And Trump liked that. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't until things uh, truly became became violent later in the day, and, and Trump somehow became convinced after this series of pleas from uh, any number of advisors that he finally told him to go home. It's, it's, it's bewildering and shocking, isn't it, to, to hear that? I, I, so, so you've clearly learned um, a deal about how he spent those three hours. Um, is there anything that you, um, that you still don't know and that you want to know? Sure. You know, we we feel like as reporters, we uncovered every rock that we could possibly find uh, and get our hands on. And yet there's still more to know because we don't have the power that Congress has to subpoena records and documents and emails. And there were key sources, uh, key witnesses to the events on January 6th who uh, were hostile to us as journalists, who were not willing to share uh, their accounts for the benefit of history. And so there's more to learn still. You know, we would love to know, for example, the full list of the people President Trump was communicating with that day. Who was he on the phone with? Did he have any phone calls, for example, uh, with uh, Rudy Giuliani, John Eastman, and some of the others who were in that uh, so-called command center at the Willard Hotel? Uh, we know they were in touch leading up to January 6th. Uh, you have to assume that Trump had some communication with his personal attorney during that day, but we just don't know the full extent of it or, or what was said. Uh, there are other things, too. We would love to know uh, what kind of contact the president had with any of the organizers of, of these various uh, protests in the days leading up to January 6th to be able to really take stock uh, of his complicity in in the events that unfolded on January 6th. Those are some of the questions, by the way, that the congressional uh, investigation is, is trying to answer. It's one of the reasons why they've subpoenaed people like Steve Bannon uh, and Mark Meadows and, and, and other, other figures in the administration and at the Justice Department. And, uh, you know, for, for the benefit of history, we would hope that, that some of that information and those records become public at some time. Mm. I, I, I was saying to you just before we joined the call that um you know uh, 
clearly taught us doesn't do breaking news, but it doesn't mean we're not vulnerable to the um, to the urge. And um, I saw a push notification yesterday from from the post that said. Mark Meadows, the former chief of staff, is cooperating with the January 6th committee. And I immediately went, oh, my God, this is huge. And um, yeah. went on and had a look at it. And, and I now no longer think it's huge because I've just spoken to you before this call. Could you explain to people why, why it might be a bit underwhelming? Well, it, it's significant that Meadows is, is cooperating to some degree. He's not completely hostile uh, to the committee the way Steve Bannon was. But we don't know what that cooperation looks like. We don't know, for example, mm -hmm. uh, how and when he's going to fork over the documents that the committee is looking for. We don't know uh, whether he's going to give truthful and full uh, answers to their questions, you know, if and when he sits for an interview. Mm -hmm. Is he going to offer the kind of detail and, and texture and nuance that the committee is looking for? Or is he going to just, you know, cooperate by showing up, but not actually answer the questions and not provide the information? Uh, that that's central to this investigation. And it comes, by the way, as President, former President Trump, uh, his attorneys are in court trying to uh, prevent the release of a lot of the, the paper records, the emails and other phone logs and other records from the White House uh, claiming executive privilege. And so that certainly is an argument that we might expect Meadows to make, you know, with this committee at some point. Uh, in, a, in a deeper way than he already has. Yeah, undoubtedly, because as, as you um, as you allude to, you know, even just being able to see the log of calls incoming to the White House in that 187 minutes would be would be gripping and, and yeah. illuminating. Well, thank, thanks for that, Phil. And um, I wonder, um, a Amy, if I might bring you back in. Um, I really want to. Uh, I'm conscious that we we gallop through the time here. Um, I really want to think about how this is playing now because I, I think it's it, it's inevitable, isn't it? The you know the the sort of the the kinetic energy of the day is what really draws your attention, but it's it's the it's the consequence um, in all of its forms that that really we need to focus on as well. So I, I'm. It's inherent in our question how secure is um, is democracy. What, I wonder if we could just spend a, a moment thinking about, you know, elections and and the the infrastructure that that keeps them credible. What are you seeing that that might give you pause when the midterms come? Is there any concern about, you know, interference with elections? I suppose. Sure, uh, a very important question also. You know, one of the things that Roz and I endeavored to do with the after chapter was to document how, as Matea said, uh, January 6th was not a one-off event. It was, it was a culmination and a beginning at the same time of the false claims of fraud. And, and Roz and I had already been spending much of the year before we launched this project documenting how the the lies that fueled the anger and violence that we saw on January 6th had been spreading around the country. I was documenting the ways that state legislatures were changing their laws mm. under pressure from constituents who uh, were loyal to President Trump and believed his false claims about the election. Uh, you know, laws that were, were, were going to make it more difficult to vote and were being passed in the name of election security. Roz was documenting the calls for these partisan forensic audits in, in the states uh, to, to, re, to re-examine the vote in search of fraud, despite the fact that most states actually conduct audits as a matter of course, and there had been no evidence of any kind of widespread fraud documented anywhere in the country mm -hmm. uh, after November 3rd. Um, so, so one of the big takeaways of, of after uh, the third chapter was that this lie has completely taken over the Republican Party. Uh, now you see uh, Republican candidates for office as we head into the 2022 midterm cycle with lots of governors and senators and members of Congress and state legislatures and secretaries of state and attorneys general at the state level up for election who are claiming their loyalty to the false claims about the election. You're seeing Trump endorse candidates only those mm -hmm. who have embraced these lies and they're running for offices 
uh, that have some, uh, you know, authority over the administration of the elections, whether it's to pass laws in state legislatures or to actually administer the elections in the Secretary of State office. Uh, and in other cases, we're seeing uh, proponents of the false claims uh, apply for jobs in election offices. Mm -hmm. We're seeing existing officials at the state and local level who believe these false claims uh, uh, actually talking about their concerns about equipment in their own offices. Uh, it's, it's what law enforcement and uh, some election officials are calling insider threats. We've seen a case in, in uh, excuse me, in Colorado where a local election clerk has been barred from administering elections in Mesa County, Colorado, because she allowed conspiracy theorists to help walk her through uh, revealing uh, the, the the hard drive of election equipment in her in her uh, office, and that in and of itself is a threat to the security of the election. Uh, you know, sort of giving the blueprint to how election machines work out to the public. Uh, so, the 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 long answer or the short answer is that uh, election security is in jeopardy. Ironically, as a result of this push to question the infrastructure as it stood prior to this wave of conspiracy theories uh, yes, that emerged. It, because it is interesting that, that um, you, you know, I mean, there was, there was extremely visible pressure placed on, you know, states like Wisconsin, Georgia, by Trump. Um, but, but actually that infrastructure seemed to withstand the pressure but as, as you say the the change of personnel and and the placing of um, people who are sympathetic to that argument is I feel uh, like the one of the big takeaways is that the the security uh, uh, the, the election system is only as secure as the people who are in positions of power to administer it mm -hmm. much like our democracy is uh, is strong uh, until you know, particular aspects of it become weakened. And I think that's the, that's the, the, the dynamic that we are paying very close attention to right now. That's, that's really interesting. Rosa, I wonder if I could get you to, to jump in and just warm to some of these themes. Um, Amy was just touching there on, on how um, some Republicans are, are behaving. Um, I, so, so, you know, we, we, we heard Phil talk about, um, Kevin McCarthy in the House uh, a moment ago, and and you know, imploring Trump on the day to intervene and and call call people off. But how's how's he uh, talking now about the events of January the sixth, and and what and and does he is he a, a sort of avatar for others in a way? Yeah, I mean, there was uh, there was this moment right after January sixth. Uh, where there was this feeling like the shocking events of that day might change things. Um, uh, Kevin McCarthy very briefly uh, gave a speech in which he said that uh, Donald Trump had to be held accountable or have shared some of the blame for what had happened. Uh, Lindsey Graham, another uh, close Republican ally of the president, gave an impassioned speech on the night, or maybe it was the very early morning hours of January 7th on the floor of the Senate, uh, talking about how it had been a, a good run that he and Donald Trump had had, but he was out, he was done, this was it for him. Uh, and, and nearly all of those voices in the Republican Party who showed some sense of having been uh, shocked and appalled and concerned by what happened that day have now come around and are once again allies of uh, Donald Trump, are visiting him at his various properties, playing golf with him, talking about his importance to the party, holding fundraisers with him. Uh, and more broadly, the Republican Party has uh, shown little interest in investigating what happened that day. Uh, that's sort of the, the one end of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum where they actually have embraced what happened that day. There, there is a, a, a far right component of the party who has actually uh, called the people who stormed the Capitol patriots, who said that they are being unfairly prosecuted. And um, part of the concern of that is that it shows this sort of casual acceptance of uh, violence as a, as a political tool. 
And one of the things that uh, Amy and I looked at in our chapter of the project was uh, how that sort of um, embracing of violence is sort of seeping out into the electorate. And you see this real problem of uh, death threats and other threats of violence now being lodged, not just occasionally, but routinely against uh, public officials and especially against the officials who are in charge of administering elections. Uh, we yeah. did a national survey and we found uh, death threats and other threats of violence that had been lodged against uh, elections officials in at least 17 states. Uh, and all of that since January 6th, not in the weeks right after the election when things were particularly, um, when the environment was particularly hot, uh, but in the months story. since January uh, 6th, and there, there is a lot of concern uh, that, that the violence on January 6th is, is not going to be, unfortunately, uh, the end of possible um, of frightening violence in our political system, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that's obviously a huge concern. Yeah. Um, I, Aaron, I'm going to come back to you um, just to, th to think about what's, what's changed, even though, um, even though I know you were very much the before guy in this uh, in this setup. That that, um, that group of of extremist organisations who seem to find um, common ground around January sixth, you know, Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, Three Percenters. I wonder if you could um, just give us a sense of um, what's happened to them, to leadership. Are they are they are they as hot as they were? Um, and, and you know, Biden talked about the need to tackle homegrown extremism, and I, I suppose it's easy to interpret that as pu putting something firmly in the intray of the FBI. Uh, I, I wonder what's happened as, as the FBI stepped up. Good question. Um, you know, we have been looking at all of these court cases, and in some ways, uh, you know, this was an amazing opportunity for law enforcement to see hundreds and thousands of people who were ready in a, at a point to act on um, their extremist beliefs and views. And so some of those, you know, hundreds uh, that are under uh, investigation now have been charged. Um, question is, do they feel scarred by this, that they would, you know, return home and, and abandon their beliefs we're not hearing a lot of that. Um, we're, you know, in some ways, that's one of the things I've heard in a few different court cases when judges have said, you're not showing um, any regret uh, for, for what's happened here. Uh, so, you know, the groups still exist. The groups have been in some ways emboldened by what happened. Um, you know, they still see uh, Joe Biden Democrats as this axis of evil, if you will, in the, in the country that are willing to um, impose all kinds of uh, rules against, uh, you know, their freedom loving ways. Uh, mm. A lot of this is wrapped up right now, of course, with all the corona, continued coronavirus restrictions that they feel uh, that they, you know, shouldn't have to abide by mask mandates or, mm. you know, uh, your various, uh, you know, public good health measures. Quite um, so the, the groups are strong. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I suppose it's, uh, you know, I, mean, I suppose we've all become familiar with the term gaslighting uh, in the last few years. It, it, it is particularly extraordinary, isn't it, that um, the people who um, made a very overt and public and violent challenge to democracy um, assert that they're speaking up for and in defense of American freedom. It, it's, it's hard to reconcile, to say the least. Right. I mean, in the, you know, there were a lot of Democrats who came in uh, in this last election with Biden being um, sworn in, saying we need to Trump Trump proof the presidency and it, you know put some guardrails in so that someone can do this again. And there's been none of those kind of laws that have passed or in the current polarized environment really could pass right now. Uh, so much of the transition of power is is. Uh, is, you know, happens through tradition and decorum in the United States, and that remains the case. I think what Amy and Roz uh, have focused on and, you know, leave us more worried is that would we even get to a January 6th moment again, that there may be this, um, uh, you know, ability to influence, to, you know, question the vote and, uh, you know, 
manipulate the vote even before you, you get past election day. Mm -hmm. Again, I mean, we alluded to it earlier, you know, Trump was in plain sight um, challenging the uh, the validity of the election from about 15 months out, wasn't he? He started um, talking about postal votes and uh, and already sort of seeding this idea that if I lose, it's going to be because it was rigged. Um, Phil, I, I, at the risk of um, at the risk of, you know, a bunch of journalists um, only talking about journalism, um, I wonder if I could uh, talk to you about journalism. It, what, what, yeah. So I suppose that, uh, I, what I'm wondering is what what I don't think it's a I don't think it's a partisan thing to say that in many ways um, re Republicans have abdicated responsibility for for accounting for January the sixth, and I wonder what that does to political journalism, even as you set out on a story, because, you know, I suppose in the time honored way, if you were in search of um, balance and impartiality, reporters would, would generally try and um, almost literally weigh the, um, the, the appearance of, of both sides. And you, you, would, you would have an equivalence in your stories that, was, that made sure you'd heard from both sides. How do you, um, how do you approach that if one side is is lying or or <clears throat> acting in pursuit of disinformation? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, first of all, just to be clear, not every Republican uh, is abdicating that responsibility. There are a couple of uh, Republican members of Congress, Liz Cheney, uh, Adam Kingsinger, who are, are members of that January 6th commission. And, uh, you know, furthermore, there, there are a few other prominent Republicans in the country who um, are, are supporting that inquiry. Mitt Romney, the senator from Utah, is one example. But you're correct to say that the vast majority of elected Republicans um, are really, uh, you know, enthralled to former President Trump right now and uh, afraid of crossing him and, and therefore afraid of, uh, of a, a serious, sober, fact-finding inquiry into what happened on January 6th. And our role as journalists is not to have any sort of a partisan bias. I mean, that's that's not what we're here for, but we do have a bias for the truth and right. a bias for fact and reality. And, you know, I think you can tell in the, the tone of our coverage at the Washington Post and you see it in other mainstream news outlets in this country as well, uh, that, you know, when, when the sky is blue, we're going to say the sky is blue <laughs> in, in, in the paper. And if a political party thinks the sky is purple, uh, well, you know, they can think that, but we're not going to play a both sides game where we, yeah. you know, where we give equal weight to their point of view when we can determine what the truth is. And the truth is that the sky is blue. And so we have to kind of have that mindset um, going forward. You're sort of fact checking in real time, aren't you? Exactly. Um, I did. I did think it was interesting yeah. as a, as a as a sort of postscript to um, to the work that we're talking about here that um, you did the due diligence thing and put, I believe, thirty seven um, findings of fact to um, to Trump seeking a response. And uh, and when you got it, you chose not to publish it in full because it did, as I understand it, um, I haven't read it because you haven't published it, um, dealt in, um, in on truths about the election. He, uh, former President Trump provided us a, a statement that was lengthy um, and veered into subjects that did not pertain to January 6th and contained some false information and derogatory claims. And so we made an editorial decision at the Washington Post not to publish the statement in full. We, of course, um, you know, gave full, full airing to his arguments about January 6th and his claims uh, in response to our reporting about him on January 6th, but we were not going to give him sort of a, a, a free pass to, to mm -hmm. effectively publish on our website things that were knowingly false uh, or derogatory or frankly not relevant to the reporting project that we were so it's, it's really interesting that you know if everyone recalls the early hours um after uh, after the election you know when when trump went into the east room and and was live on tv some of the networks cut away from him um when he was he was dealing in um disinformation and it it, it was certainly in, in our newsroom actually a subject of um 
you know, let's say there were two editors and three opinions. It's one of those conversations, you know, where um, no one could quite agree on on whether it was right to um, let the public make up their minds or whether it was meet for, um, you know, the the broadcasters to take responsibility for, for not um, putting disinformation in front of them. You're almost having to fact check in real time all the time, aren't you? Um, I, I just wonder if we're, we're getting towards the end and I have failed in my duty to um, uh, go for questions, um, but I can see that you already um, presciently answered some of the things that are going through the chat. Um, um, I, I think um, very admirably, but I wonder if um, I could just ask you a couple um, as, as we start to wind up. I, I, I wonder how do you all, um, I could take you in turn on this, how do you all now think of the events of January the 6th? We did a, we did a podcast ourselves um, in the relatively early days afterwards when Chuck Hagel, um, the former Defence Secretary, told us that um, he described it as a coup. He said uh, very clearly that was a coup. Um, and uh, uh, it's not a word that appears in, in your work. Um, I wonder, what is, how do you label it? I wonder if I'd start with you, Aaron. Well, I think um, you know, the reporting drives right up to that line, right? And uh, if uh, what we found was executed a little better, um, it very well could have been uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, there were a lot of things and uh, a lot of elements in place that day. And um, it, came, it came very close to, uh, to not having a, a peaceful transition of power. Um, you know, I think the reason that the Washington Post put the efforts that we did into um, you know, reanalyzing that day, this, and, and as Matea said, there were 75 journalists involved with this effort over the past six months. Um, it was just about everything that Roz, Phil, and Amy and I uh, slept and breathed for months. Uh, is that it, we did, we don't see this as just uh, a one-time thing. That is, that in fact, uh, there are elements within the country, uh, very strong and still powerful elements within the country that um, that uh, will take power at all costs. And and so, uh, how is that going to play out over the next couple election cycles? Will will the uh, United States come back from the brink in a way on after all of this, or? We just at the beginning of a really disturbing uh, period in the United States, and I don't think we will know the answer to that for a long time. But we wanted to lay down a marker on January 6th with everything that we knew, and uh, at least have a starting point to, for our reporting going forward. That is a chilling um, set of things to say. It's really it is remarkable that that that's where we've got to. Um, Amy, I'll, I'll, I'll spare you answering the same question because perhaps you, um, you know, that, that feels like a, a, a thought through collective um, um, spot that you all got to. I, I wonder if we could um, think maybe a, a bit from a slightly different angle. Are there warnings, do you think, in the events of January the 6th for other democracies about the rise of populism, the tactics of populism? Certainly. I mean, I think uh, we know that uh, President Trump's rise uh, coincided with the rise of uh, similar uh, populist uh, and sort of authoritarian or authoritarian adjacent uh, style leaders in other countries, in South mm -hmm. America and Europe uh, and elsewhere. And uh, so, you know, the, the takeaway for me is that January 6th was this wake up call uh, that our democracy is fragile, like, like all democracies. And that this, that, that this country is as strong as the people who are in the positions of power, uh, hewing to the traditions and the laws and the intentions of those laws and our constitution. Uh, and, uh, and that is, frightening because we we can see uh steps happening in its aftermath that would seem to point in the direction of those institutions weakening even further potentially as we go forward into the future 
I, we're bang on the half hour mark, but I'm going to just go over slightly just to hear finally from, from Roz and then from Phil. Um, Roz, where's your reporting going next? What do you still want to know? Uh, well, there's still some questions. I think Phil was addressing them, some of them earlier about President Trump on that day. But I, I think we're spending a lot of our time uh, on the topic of, of what happens next with democracy um, to expand a bit on what Amy was just saying. You know, if you think about it, uh, democracy is really an exercise in trust. Uh, we as citizens go into it together and we kind of make a, a decision to trust each other and to trust that uh, after we've had a hard fought campaign and we go into it and everyone votes, uh, other people will accept the outcome even if it means that their preferred candidates lose. Mm -hmm. uh, and if the bonds of that trust start to fray, uh, democracy can't ultimately survive. There has to be an agreement between us that we will accept the outcome of an election even when we lose. Uh, so we're spending a lot of our time uh, moving forward in sort of gauging the bonds of trust uh, within American society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a huge issues, aren't they? Phil, go on. Just let me give you the the, the, the final word. It's a, um, it's a tricky question, but just looking ahead to 2024, um, what do you think? Will it be decided at the ballot box or in the courts or on the streets? Well, we can't quite predict that. Um, but I, I, and and there's no way to know, right? Um, but I, I would point back to a question you asked a few minutes ago, which is. How do you think about the events of January 6th? And I think a lot of people in this country think of that as a, as a singular event on the calendar, a, a single day, uh, like September 11th. And what our reporting has shown, and especially the chapter that Roz and Amy wrote about the aftermath, is it wasn't a day. It, the threat is not extinguished. It, it's alive and breathing all around the country. And you know what happened on January 6th could happen again and again and again, and with more strategic planning and more force and, and potentially uh, a successful outcome uh, of a coup in the future, uh, the, the, all of the forces that led to January 6th are still, um, are still with us in America, and there are millions of people who continue to believe um, through the spreading of disinformation that, uh, that the election was rigged, that it was stolen, that Joe Biden is an illegitimate president, and so that's a threat to to the democracy and the trust that Roz was talking about. And it, I think it's gonna shape uh, everything in American politics between now and, and, uh, and the inauguration in January of 2025, <laughs> because that period between the, the 2024 November election and the January inauguration could be quite profound. Yeah, we're all gonna be circling January the 6th in our calendars um, yeah. for, forever and a day now, I think. Um, it, Guys, thank you so much for um, for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope you um, are going to uh, join us again in future for um, for some more instalments. I really, uh, obviously, love to have the baseball conversation with you, um, but failing that, you know, we're we're definitely um, all eyes on on the work you're doing and and where it goes next. Um, so again, I thank you for joining us um, from the States, everyone. And um, for those of you in the UK as well, um, who I hope it's, uh, I hope it's the start of a, of a great partnership and um, we'll speak again soon. Thanks again. Thank you. Cheers.